I want to congratulate all of you this morning. You've survived. (laughs) I don't just mean all of the family and the food and football and whatever else happens with Thanksgiving, but also that more recent phenomenon, Black Friday. It's that day after Thanksgiving, known for its big sales, officially kicking off the Christmas shopping season. Uh, It's not even just Friday. They keep backing it up earlier and earlier into Thursday now. So Black Friday really begins Thursday evening. This past week, I saw a humorous picture online of a young boy asking, so you're telling me people in America say they're thankful for everything they have, and a couple hours later, they're at every store buying stuff they don't need? That's pretty much our society in a nutshell. (laughs) Uh, We are very blessed, but we always need more. Uh, It's like the words to the song, we've got more than we need and less than we want. Or like that classic Rolling Stones hit, I can't get no satisfaction. Well, this morning I'd like to share with you the secret to satisfaction. I believe that we can go against the trend, we can go against the flow of our society, and live a satisfied life. We are given the the route to make that happen in the scriptures. See, the Christians are called to live by a different standard. The Bible says the fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. Luke 3.14 very briefly says, be content with your pay. In 1 Timothy 6.8, Paul says, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And then Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Notice the one word that appears in every verse. It's the word content. Now the Greek word for that appears several times in the New Testament. It means sufficient. It means enough. And that seems so strange in a culture where we never have enough. And yet the Bible says that we can have a mindset that realizes what we have is enough. What we have is sufficient. We can be content. Now, contentment is defined in terms of a a general satisfaction with one's state or condition in life that produces a pleasing, tranquil state of existence. It's really a pathway to peace. If we want to have peace in our lives... Contentment will be a big part of that as we learn how to be satisfied. This past week, I listened to a sermon my father preached years ago called The Contented Life, taken from the very passage we're going to look at this morning. And it it was great for me just just to hear his voice again, uh, but also to gain some insights And how to find the secret to satisfaction. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Philippians chapter 4. It's where we'll be spending the bulk of our time this morning. Philippians chapter 4. This was a letter that Paul had written while he was in prison at Rome awaiting trial. The Philippian church was not a particularly wealthy church. And yet they gave very generously to support the apostle. And he was in part writing this letter as a thank you note for their generosity and their goodness to him. But he's winding down the letter. And as we get to chapter 4, beginning in verse 10, we read, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned but had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, because I have learned to be content 
whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. After expressing his thanks in verse 10, Paul says in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. He's not begging for more. He's not trying to lay a big guilt trip on the Philippian Christians. He's saying, I appreciate what you've done, but I want you to know that regardless of what I have materially, I have learned to be content. I've learned to be satisfied whatever the circumstances. He wanted to show them that first and foremost, he was dependent upon God. And if he had God, he had all that he needed. But in this text, we're going to see three steps, three lessons in the secret of satisfaction, living a satisfied life. The first step is learning of his sufficiency. Learning of his sufficiency. Now you'll notice that Paul uses that word content a couple of times in the text that I just read. But it's a different Greek word than those verses that I mentioned earlier. Uh, This is a compound form of that earlier term. And, And it is a term that probably literally could be translated self sufficiency. It was a favorite term of the Stoics in those days. They believed that man should be able by the power of his own will to resist the control of the circumstances he found himself in. That's the idea of being Stoic, where you can remain calm no matter what's going on around you. To be independent of external circumstances. The Stoics taught that was the highest goal in life. If you could get to the point where nothing bothered you, then you had reached the pinnacle of Stoicism. But Paul's self-sufficiency wasn't the same as the Stoics taught in his own day and age. It was Christ's sufficiency. He wasn't depending upon himself. He was depending on Christ. He found his sufficiency there. He could be independent of his circumstances because he was dependent on Christ. And he knew that Christ would provide all that he needs. That's how he could make this statement. He writes in 2 Corinthians 3 verses 4 and 5, Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. This is the key to a healthy self-image. It's not that I think I'm so great, it's God is great and God is in me. My competence, my confidence, my sufficiency, my satisfaction comes from God. Learning of his sufficiency. This isn't pride. Paul isn't saying, look how great I am. He's saying, look how great he is. That's the key. Paul was not a victim of circumstances. He was a victor over circumstances. He learned how to rise above life's changing circumstances. No longer had the power to control him no matter how difficult they became. And I'm not suggesting that circumstances don't matter. I'm not saying that they they don't affect us. What I'm saying is we need not live in their grip. Our emotional state, our spiritual state, our psychological state should not be dependent upon what's going on around us. 
because we have Christ within us. And we can rise above what's going on around us. Think about it. We can't control circumstances. So much of our lives we cannot control. Can't control the weather, right? We can't control what other people do. We can't control what the government stipulates. We can't control so much. We cannot control our circumstances, but we can get to a point where they don't control us either. See, some people are like thermometers. They merely register what's going on around them. If a situation is tight and pressurized, they register tension and irritability. If it's stormy, they register worry and fear. If it's calm, quiet, and comfortable, they register satisfaction and and relaxation and peacefulness. That's a thermometer. Other people are thermostats. They regulate the atmosphere. They make the, uh, the mature choices that despite of what's going on around them, they don't allow the situation to dictate to them. That's what Paul's talking about. Having that inner sense within you that no matter what's happening, I know where my confidence lies. I can be satisfied wherever I am. Now, you might be thinking, I wish I had that contentment gift. I don't remember him talking about that when we were talking about spiritual gifts over the last several weeks. Well, it's not a gift. It's not something that some people have and that everybody else wishes they had. I want you to learn, notice, Paul says on more than one occasion here, I have learned how to be content. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. This is not something that comes naturally. This was something that he had to learn. It doesn't just happen to us. Now, some people just chalk it up to temperament. Oh, that's just the way they are. That's just their personality. They were born that way. But contentment is not genetic. It is an attitude that is learned, having been deliberately cultivated over time. Attitude governs contentment. It is a state of mind. Through the power of Christ, Paul had learned to encounter a broad spectrum of circumstances without letting them bring him down. He had learned to live beyond them and to get through them. Now the words have learned are in the original Greek, I have come to learn. It's the process doesn't happen overnight. Also, in the Greek, the I is emphatic. I, for my part, whatever others might feel, I have come to learn this. Again, he's not dependent upon others around him. He has learned this lesson of Christ's sufficiency. He may go through difficult experiences of life in order to learn to be content. It's something that we must work on. It's something that uh, comes with practice and it comes over time. This kind of satisfaction is not learned in a classroom. It's not learned on a Sunday morning in church. It's where the action is. We may want to receive inner contentment and spiritual adequacy instantly by reading a book by praying a prayer, by listening to a sermon, but that's not how you develop contentment. It's just like developing patience. I kind of cringe when I hear somebody pray for patience. Because you know how you get patience? Going through tough stuff. And I tell people, you're praying for patience, you're really praying for problems. (laughs) Because that's what it's going to take for you to develop patience. And the same is probably true with contentment. To learn contentment, we're going to have to experience a broad range of circumstances, and not all of them are pleasant. But that's what it takes to learn this important lesson. As Christians, we may start complaining when times are hard, 
or we can discipline ourselves to be content. Reckoning that we have enough no matter what. And notice, when he says, I'm content or I've had enough, those are relative terms. His situation changed. There were times when he had more than enough. Sometimes he didn't quite have enough. But it was enough, because that was where his mind was. And we can learn that same secret. Moving on in verse 12, Paul repeats, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Except he's not quite repeating himself. Because here where he says, I have learned, is more properly rendered, I've been initiated. He has learned by experience. Uh, This is something, again, that he's had to uh, live through. He's learned the secret. Technically, it says, I've been initiated in the mystery. (laughs) And that was a big deal back then. The mystery is, Christ is all I need. And he had learned that. A second step to the secret of satisfaction is leaning on his sovereignty. Paul had come to realize that life was not a series of accidents, it's a series of appointments. Things just don't happen. Things have a reason. Even beyond that, things have a purpose. And those are two very different things. The reason why something happens is very different than the purpose why it happens. The Bible does not teach fatalism. The Bible does not teach that our our destiny is set in stone and no one or nothing can change it. But rather there is a God in heaven who rules the universe. The theological term for that is providence. And no, I'm not talking about the capital of Rhode Island. This is God's power, his control that he exercises in his creation. Now, in this day of scientific achievement, we hear less and less of the providence of God. Mankind has convinced itself that we are actually in control. We are the masters of our fates. But that is certainly contrary to what the Word of God teaches. God works in nature. He works in the lives of people. Even that word providence comes from two Latin words, pro meaning before and video meaning to see. God can see beforehand what is going to happen. He knows the end from the beginning and he works so that his will comes about. Paul experienced this divine providence in his life and ministry. He was able to write in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. No circumstance could ever arise that could defeat Paul's God, and therefore no circumstance could ever beat Paul. He knew that God was at work regardless of how it looked at the time. Regardless of what others tried to do, God was at work. Even when he didn't see his prayers answered the way he wanted, he could see God's sovereignty. We read in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, To keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In the original Greek, 
where it says, my grace is sufficient for you, that's the same Greek word translated content in those verses I read at the beginning of the message. Be content with God's grace. It is enough. It is sufficient. It will see you through regardless of what you're experiencing at the time. God will see you through. Too often we want to fight against the circumstances we face to try to force them into our favor. And not only is that usually impossible because most of the time our circumstances are out of our control, it's also wrong. One of the statements in my dad's sermon that really jumped out at me, he said, fighting circumstances is fighting God because he is ultimately in control of our circumstances. Well, that doesn't mean we become passive and just let everything happen to us. But we acknowledge God's sovereignty. We acknowledge his control. We allow him to work. And that gives us a flexibility that Paul wrote about there in Philippians. Where he said, I have learned. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. As Chuck Swindoll says, in the yo-yo of life, we need to learn to flex. (laughs) And we do. We need to be flexible. We need to be able to roll with the circumstances in life. Because if we fight against them, we're almost always fighting a losing battle. And life becomes frustrating. It becomes difficult. But when we allow God to work, we see how his plan is developed in our lives. Because if we don't flex, we will snap. You can take that literally, you can take that figuratively. I think it applies either way. The third step in this secret to the satisfied life is leaning on his strength. Paul concludes in verse 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now this verse is often taken out of its context and just quoted on its own. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can walk on water. I can raise the dead. I can heal the sick. That's not what Paul's saying here. Understand this verse where it was written. Paul says, I can do all these things that I've been talking about. I can be content whether I have a lot or whether I have a little. I can do these things in Christ. Now, I'm not saying that's the only way Christ gives us strength, but first and foremost, this is the context. This is what Paul is saying. I can do this. You see, if you read verses 10 through 12 and you say, well, that's nice, Paul, that's you, I can't do it. I could never live that kind of a life. Paul says, you're wrong. You can do it because you can do it through Christ. Anybody can live this kind of life because it wasn't Paul and something special about him that enabled him to do it. This is available to all. Anyone can learn this secret. Anyone can live by this secret. Because it is Christ who gives us the strength. And when we lean on his strength, we will find that he can do it through us. Paul isn't saying that he's all powerful, he can do anything he wants. He is saying that he can learn to be content in all circumstances. I like how the Living Bible puts this verse. I can do everything God asks me to with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. It doesn't say I can leap tall buildings in a single bound. It says I can do whatever Christ asks me to do because he gives me the strength. The Amplified Bible puts it very simply. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. We have all that we need because we have Christ. Now, as you listen to these words, you may find yourself in a situation, in a circumstance that is less than ideal. 
Life has not only become difficult and frustrating, it may be growing more miserable by the day. Truth be told, life right now may be almost unbearable for you. The great temptation is to allow those circumstances to embitter you, to turn you into someone who lives under a dark cloud, where doom and gloom characterize your outlook. Life's hard. There's there's just no question about that. You live in a situation that resembles a house arrest like Paul was when he wrote the Philippians. You feel chained to your past, unable to escape your present circumstances. Maybe you've lived this way so long that negative thinking has become a habit. You can't imagine thinking any other way. I've got wonderful news. There is hope beyond your current situation. You can live above your circumstances. If a man named Paul could live above his unbelievably trying circumstances, so can you. But to do that, Christ must be your central focus. He must not only be your Savior who has taken away your sins, He must be your Lord. He must be your source of strength. He must be the focus of your outlook. He alone can empower you to live wherever you are in life. And your external circumstances may not change, but you will. Because in the final analysis, you are the only one you can control. (laughs) And you will find yourself changing. You will find yourself adapting. You will find yourself learning the secret to be content in any and all circumstances. And when that happens you will find a satisfaction in life that maybe you hadn't felt before. When you realize that Christ is your sufficiency. And instead of seeing yourself as a victim, you will find the victory in Jesus through his strength. And the result of that is you'll make a difference Because the way you respond to the circumstances that once defeated you. Other people are watching you, whether you realize it or not. People are watching your life. And when they see you satisfied, when they see you content despite your circumstances, it will be nothing short of heroic in their eyes. What a testimony! To see somebody going through the valleys of life and yet not losing their satisfaction. Not losing their contentment. The good life exists only when we stop wanting a better one. The itch for things is a virus that drains the soul of satisfaction. A Christian can live the contented life by Learning, by leaving, and by leaning. By learning to be content in any circumstance and learning the secret of being content that God's grace is enough. God's grace is sufficient. By leaving all of our circumstances in God's hands, leaving all of our worries behind us, and by leaning not on our own understanding, but leaning on His strength leaning on his promises that we find in his word. That's the secret to a satisfied life. You're not going to find it on Black Friday. (laughs) You're not going to find it on Cyber Monday. You're not going to find it in the stuff of earth. You're going to find it in only one place, and that is in a real day-by-day relationship with Jesus Christ. He is our sufficiency. He is enough. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? 
Heavenly Father, we admit that we are a very blessed people. You have given us far more than we need. It may not be all that we want, but you have certainly blessed us. But there are times in our lives when we don't sense that prosperity. Times can be lean. We may lose things money cannot buy, relationships. We may lose our own health. We may lose our livelihood. Father, those are the times when we need to sense your presence, to feel your power, and to learn the secret of being content, knowing that if God is for us, who can be against us? As long as we have Christ, we have enough. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.